T. Melman, co-author of the new book, Every Spy a Prince, The Complete History of Isra Israel's Intelligence Community. Who was Eli Cohen? Eli Cohen was an Israeli spy who penetrated the high echelons of the Syrian government in the early 60s. And he provided Israel with the best information available. What was so different about his uh, intelligence activities? What made his story so famous? Uh, that he befriended the top echelons of the Syrian government, including the president of Syria. He became a friend of Syrian Air Force pilots, and he provided the information to Israel, and it helped Israel to win the war, the Six Days War in 67. And later on, he was arrested and hanged by the Syrians. So he's dead. He's dead. Yeah. How did he do it? Well, he, he was of Egyptian origins. He was born in uh, Egypt as a Jew. Later on in the early 50s, emigrated to Israel, as many Jews do. Uh, uh, recruited by the Israeli intelligence, by the military intelligence, later on by Mossad. Um, trained by them. Um, received a new identity from his Israeli handlers as a Syrian trader and he went to establish his identity, new identity, he went to Argentina which used to have a huge Syrian community and he befriended the Syrian community in Argentina, uh, got their trust and from Argentina, from Buenos Aires, was sent to Damascus, to Syria operating as a, as a legitimate a merchant, uh, but actually was an Israeli spy. Dan Raviv, uh, co-author of Every Spy a Prince, what's the story about the Israeli intelligence community's ability to steal an, a MiG-21 from Iraq? Well, what they had to do was convince a pilot to do it in the mid-60s. The Israelis are very good at cataloging everything they possibly can about the chief officers of the armies of the Arab countries surrounding them. It often includes Air Force pilots. So dossiers are collected by Amman, that's Israeli military intelligence, about everything they can, personal lives, where they live, looking for points of weakness. Well, they found a man called Munir Redfa in Iraq, an, an Iraqi Air Force pilot. They found out that he wasn't quite happy about everything. Among other things, he was disappointed at the time or unhappy that Iraq was bombing Kurdish rebels, Kurdish uh, minority villages, just like these days, it, it happens as well. Well, anyway, the Israelis approached him through a woman. They sent a female agent to Baghdad. Uh, she uh, befriended him, and it was, uh, well, what in the intelligence business they call a honey trap. She lured him to go abroad to Paris. You know, come, and in Paris you can have, you know, all my charms. And he did, and he already was suspicious that maybe she's an intelligence officer, but he was willing. And in Paris, she introduced him to Israelis, took him to Israel. The deal was done. A million dollars, shelter. His wife and children, yes, he was married, also were smuggled out of Iraq. And the Redfas live in Israel now, new names, etc. got his million dollars. And more importantly, Israel and the United States, and everyone Israel wanted to share it with in the West, got a look at that MiG. So it's, it's quite a feat, considered one of their best achievements. What, uh, what got the two of you interested in doing a book? By the way, it said the complete history of Israel's intelligence community. Um, we met in London as, a working, as working journalists, and that was in 1981. Uh, after a couple of years in 1984, we started writing articles for British and American newspapers here for the Washington Post. Most of our articles were dealing with the Middle East, with Israeli politics, but also with defense and security and intelligence uh, related issues. Um, sometime along the way, we thought we have a story to tell. We are writing articles about the Middle East, about intelligence, strategic uh, issues. Let's try to write a book about a story which until then I, I don't think has been told in to, to, to the extent we wanted it to, to be told. And we decided that we would try to research for a book about the complete history of the Israeli intelligence. Because until then, until this book comes out, other books had been written. 
but basically they are of glorifying nature, portraying, portraying the Israeli intelligence as supermen, not human beings. Um, and uh, we wanted also to convey the history of Israel and the problems facing the Middle East through the eyes of the intelligence community. So this book is not just about uh, the history of Israel's intelligence, but also, to a, to a certain extent, the history of the state of Israel and the history of the Arab-Israeli-Palestinian conflict. Where were you born and raised? I was born in Poland, uh, but raised in Israel. My parents immigrated to Israel when I was six years old. That was in 1957 and uh, all my up upbringing is in Israel. I'm an Israeli citizen, I served in the Israeli army, I went to, a, uh, to a, an Israeli university. Where are you now? Um, I spent the last year at Harvard as a Neiman Fellow at Harvard University and I'm going back to Israel to work as a journalist there. And by the way, when you go back to Israel, you still have military duty to do every year? Uh, yes, yes, as a reservist, uh, up to 30, 40 days a year. Dan Raviv, where are you from? Uh, I'm a New Yorker, born in New York, raised in New York. City? Uh, yeah, New York City, and the, my parents moved out to Long Island, where they are, and uh, Harvard educated, but then moved overseas. Got a job with CBS News as a reporter in Tel Aviv. After two years there, moved to London, where I've been for the last 10 years with CBS News. We hear you mostly on the radio? That's right, uh, so there's some television work as well, mainly radio work for CBS. When did you first get interested in the intelligence story? Mm. In writing about Israeli politics with Yossi, writing some pieces for the Washington Post and, uh, and other newspapers, and it, it was a repeated fact that a lot of the information came from, well, from Israeli leaks, from Israeli experts, and we were fascinated as well with uh, how do they do it? How do they collect so much? How does it work? But also from time to time came across obvious flaws, obvious problems. I covered uh, trials in, in, in Britain of uh, you know Israelis who were uh, smugglers or even a, a kidnapping case where the part of the defense was we were working for the Mossad that kind of thing and it made you wonder how much truth there is in that and uh, again uh, we all could go to the bookstore or the library and get a book called the Mossad or whatever and it, they can be wonderful books but it's just adventure stories that no one's looked at it seriously that's what we decided to do so no apologies for calling it the complete history we certainly uh, did our best is 1973 and the surprise of the egyptian syrian invasion the biggest mistake the, the intelligence community has ever made um yes in terms of its impact on on israel that was the biggest mistake and it was a, a costly one more than, than 2,000 israeli soldiers were killed in the 73 war uh, but in terms of the most embarrassing incident, I think that uh, the failure in 1973, in July 1973, to assassinate the right person. Israel was after the leader of uh, a Palestinian group, Black September, uh, who was responsible for the massacring of Israeli athletes a year earlier at the Olympics. And Israel as uh, Israeli intelligence, as ordered by the Prime Minister then, Golda Meir, uh, was after him and after his associates. Twelve, twelve of them were, were assassinated by the Israeli intelligence, by a hit team selected by the Mossad. And uh, mistakenly, in July 73, in a small town called Lillehammer in Norway, the Israeli hit team killed the wrong person. A poor Moroccan waiter. Uh, that was the and they were and some some of the Israeli agents were arrested by the Norwegian police. That was the the colossal mistake, the most embarrassing mistake of, uh, of the Israeli intelligence. Other mistakes. Oh well, the 1980s is really the troubled period. Not trying to dwell on them, but finding an important pattern that that, that occurred as political control became less effective. So the invasion of Lebanon in 1982, a decision made, of course, by Prime Minister Begin and his then Defense Minister Ariel Sharon to, to go into Lebanon, clear out the PLO, but based on faulty intelligence. The Mossad's belief that it had formed a wonderful partnership with the Christians of Lebanon, that they would fight alongside the Israelis, and it, it didn't happen that way, and, and Israel really paid the price for that. Uh, Israel's involvement in Iran-gate, 
Israelis told by their prime minister to take part in the effort to sell arms to Iran, do the Americans a favor, it'll do us a favor. Again, very muddled thinking in the background, and we found the Mossad wasn't involved in it, had tried to stop it, but failed to. So bureaucratic wrangling led to that. A nuclear worker, Mordechai Vanunu, worked in the Dimona nuclear reactor, went abroad, sold many of the nuclear secrets, and uh, the domestic security people, Shin Bet, that's the equivalent of the FBI, shouldn't have let him leave the country with his photographs of the reactor. In the end, by the way, the Mossad had to uh, save the day, sent a female agent, if this sounds familiar now, to London, lured him, another honey trap. Vanunu was lured abroad to Italy and kidnapped, chained by the Mossad and brought to Israel. So in the 80s, again, it was a matter of damage control. Oh, and one last one, the Shin Bet again, that sort of FBI agency, caught torturing and killing two Palestinians who had hijacked a bus and then covering up the fact. So in the end, the Shin Bet director had to resign. It was a bad period, the 80s. And I even left one out, Jonathan Pollard, here in Washington, the, uh, the American civilian analyst at the Navy who was, uh, who was caught spying for the Israelis. And that's been terrible embarrassment, largely because he was an American Jew. And we say in the book that the Mossad should have learned ages ago not to hire Jews to do that. This picture on the screen, is that the picture of the Palestinian you were talking about? Yes, that's one, one of the two Palestinian bus hijackers caught by, those are two Shin Bet agents leading him away, their faces masked at the demand of the Israeli censor. Uh, he's being led away. He's clearly alive. But later the official report said all the bus hijackers were caught dead because someone in the Israeli press had the guts to print that photo, the story came out that they had captured them and killed them. Now, maybe if it had been handled, you know, a la Watergate with an immediate apology by the authorities, they would have gotten away with it. But they kept denying and covering up. Here's a picture of Mordecai Vanunu. That's right. That's He's the, in jail right now in Israel? Yes, serving 18 years in jail for selling those nuclear secrets. He went abroad. He said he was serving, you know, the cause of man, in effect, that the world should know that Israel has a nuclear weapon. But, uh, well, I think maybe the judges actually listened to his reasoning, because, if you will, he only got 18 years. I know I'm not going to pronounce this right. Lacan? Yes, that's Is that right? right. Yes. Mm. Um, that's the Science Liaison Bureau, or the Israelis called it Lacan, which protected the nuclear secrets. We reveal that that was its real foremost function but then ended up hiring Pollard, the American here in the U.S., who, who spied for Israel. How did you and, and find out about LACOM? When was the first time it was ever publicly mentioned? Um, over the Pollard affair. Hmm. When um, he was caught, yeah. Until na 1985, when Jonathan Pollard was arrested here in Washington, no one knew about the existence of such a uh, secret organization, not even in the... Israeli intelligence community. It was the most sacred secret of the Israeli intelligence, which is a secret, as generally speaking. And when Jonathan Pollard was arrested and Israel had to apologize um, um, for the U.S. government, um, it was revealed that he was run, recruited, and handled by LACAM the SLB, the Science Liaison Bureau. And many eyebrows were raised in Israel. Lakam? We've never heard of. What's that? And it's a and genuine agency, or it was, because it was disbanded right away to please the Americans. Prime Minister Shimon Peres disbanded Lakam. Who does the same job that Lakam used to do now. Uh, other people in the Defense Ministry. Its main job began protecting the nuclear program and also acquiring scientific and technological information from around the world. And there's no question the Israelis still have to do that. Let me ask you about this book. Can you buy this book in Israel today? Sure. It came out in Hebrew in Israel. And uh, quite modestly, it is uh, a bestseller in Israel as well. How much of what you tried to put in here was kept out by the censors? Very little, to be frank. I, I think we'd have to admit, it is very little. Uh, the chapters that Yossi wrote, which in effect came out of Israel, went through the military censor, and there was some haggling, and uh, there, there always is that. It's a fascinating system of censorship. You can go to the censor and complain, why, you, why did you take out that paragraph and deal? But I think I we have had, to admit... I had to submit my chapters to the Israeli censorship because I'm an Israeli citizen. And he's subject to those laws. But you also have to admit that you know enough about the system that you, a little bit you censor yourself. For instance, we knew that there's no point. You can't name the didn't. current director of the Mossad. Why try? What's the point? So we didn't. Why, why won't they name? As a matter of fact, you, it's one of the interesting things in the front of the book here. 
I don't know whether James can get a, a tight shot of it. You list people who have run the different agencies, uh, agencies and and right there near the one that's, uh, I can't see the date, was it 1987? 1989. This last year, the new director of the Mossad took over, and in parentheses we say, disclosure forbidden by Israeli law. What would have been the point? I'll be frank, we could have had his name, but what's the point? That's not the point of this and book. Be, I, I might land in a jail. Yeah, we'd miss Yossi terribly. <laughs> now, under this uh, section here, the commanders of military intelligence, Amman, you see a name twice there that's now fairly famous, Chaim Herzog. Who is he and what did he do? He is now the president of the state of Israel. And he came from intelligence background. He was he was trained by the British during the Second World War as an intelligence officer operated in Europe. After the war, he immigrated to Israel, joined the Israeli army in 1948, and a year later became uh, the second uh, director of Israel's uh, uh, military intelligence, of Amman. Um, then he was assigned to Washington to work as the military attaché here at the Israeli embassy. In 1954, he returned to Israel, um, rejoined the army, stayed in the army, and in 1958, once again was recalled to become uh, the chief, the commander of the military intelligence. Now later, a month. brilliant military analyst got into politics. Let's not forget in the United States, we have President Bush, who was a CIA director. It's not quite the same thing. But of course, it's a, it's a test of a man's mettle, of his patriotism. Very much trusted. Did a great job in military intelligence, so people would trust him. He has a wonderful reputation. Prime Minister Shamir. Also an intelligence background. In his case, not military intelligence. The Mossad, the foreign espionage arm, the most famous of the agencies, if you will. But Shamir won't tell you exactly what he did. He worked in Paris as operations chief for Europe for a decade, from 1955 to 65, and uh, got his experience of the world, went to lots of countries. Including some Arab countries, yeah. undercover. I read somewhere, and was it Shimon Perez who used to fly back and forth and meet with him in Paris? Not with him. Paris at that time, when Shamir was in Paris working for the Mossad, Paris was in charge of, he was the uh, director general of the defense yeah, ministry. He was director general of the m defense ministry and he was, con and Paris was conducting his own mini foreign policy, cementing the relations between Israel and France. In the 50s until the 60s, France was the major ally and supporter of the State of Israel. Only in the mid-60s, this role was taken over by United States. Uh, but I don't think that Paris at that time met with Shamir. That was, uh, that if they did, they broke a, an, a, an important intelli intelligence role. That, that's the rule of compartmentalization or departmentalization. It means that you should not know the names of your agents or and what the others are doing, oh, oh. and you do your own thing, so to speak. Exactly. Hey, but all these years later, and it's fascinating in Israel, it is something to be proud of, because Peres now in his campaign appearances, when he, when he speaks you know, for the Labor Party, will always point that out, that, oh, I was involved in clandestine business as well. I helped make sure that Israel has a certain something in Dimona, obviously referring to the nuclear reactor, or I made sure that we were friendly with France, which meant a lot. People are proud of clandestine experience, whereas perhaps in America, people would be ashamed. And, and it was France who gave Israel in 1956, 1957, uh, its, its first and only nuclear reactor. Um, or it's a big, meaningful one. There was a little yeah. research one, we but said, yes. yes. And the, so the, the French reactor. were vital, so Paris has something to be proud of, but fascinatingly, he can't reveal it all either. We've been jumping all around here. Let's go back to uh, the beginning and get the basics on the table. How many people in Israel are involved in intelligence activities? Well, it's, it's, a, it's a state secret. <laughs> uh, nobody would tell you exactly. Uh, but uh, we, we believe that there are more than 10,000 people involved directly, employed directly by the, by the various branches of the Israeli intelligence, mainly the military intelligence. Uh, one has to remember that the military intelligence, Amman, is the largest and the most important 
intelligence organization in Israel okay, and before the Mossad. Before you get to that, I want to show the audience that, uh, that how these different organizations are spelled and explain them each because you have three major intelligence gathering organizations in Israel. You start with the Mossad. What is it? Mossad means institute, by the way, and this is an institute for intelligence and special operations. So the Mossad is the foreign espionage arm. Compare it to the CIA. All right, go down here to the... Next one is Amman, Amman. right? Military intelligence. It's a Hebrew acronym. So it is the intelligence arm of the armed forces. As Yossi was saying, it in fact is the largest and most important. And then it says Shin Bet. Two Hebrew letters, initials for security services. That's the domestic agency, the, the equivalent of the FBI. Which one of the three is the most important? Oh, it would be Amman, Amman the military yeah. intelligence. Nothing is Why? more important than you're watching your Arab neighbors for actual movements of troops, how many tanks they have, where are the aircraft. All these other missions that we described are fascinating. And even getting, you know, thousands of Jews into the country is vital. But war having a sign that war is coming. That's the key, and that's Amman's job. Which is the second most important? Uh, the Mossad. The problem with, the, uh, with, the, with Amman, with the military intelligence, is that it lives in the shadow of uh, the flamboyant Mossad. Uh, uh, it, it can be compared to, this, to the same problem which is facing um, United States National Security Agency, NSA. It is the largest, the most important agency in the intelligence community. Yet, the most, imp the most famous one which gets media attention is the CIA. The same is in Israel. The Mossad has become um, sort of a, a epitomizing the Israeli intelligence. But the most important agency is military intelligence. Mossad comes second and then you have uh, Shin Bet, uh, the Israeli equivalent to the FBI, in charge of uh, fighting um, terrorism, counter-terrorism, uh, subversion, um, trying to foil plots against the state of Israel, political plots and others. You tell the story about how you tried to find out what the what they call the Mossad when they deal with uh, I publicly? A, I thought it was a reasonable question, but the trouble is uh, you can't pick up the phone book. There's no uh, Langley in, the, in Israel that you can look up you know, CIA, or in our case, uh, the Mossad. We thought we should ask, what shall we call it in English? You can translate the Hebrew words, as I said, Mossad is institute. But when they write a letter to their friends in the CIA or the British intelligence, what do they call themselves? It took a while. Uh, it was a matter of asking the prime minister's spokesman. The best you could do, because officially uh, the Mossad is under the prime minister's office. And uh, I think he sort of wondered why you want to know and all that, so we explained. And he came up with uh, the Israeli Secret Intelligence Service. I mean, if it were to have initials, it would be ISIS. Just simple words like that. Interestingly enough, a kind of a British model. The British don't really like the names MI5 and MI6 for their foreign service. They prefer SIS, Secret Intelligence Service. What was the toughest bit of information to gather for this book? I think about the extent, the involvement of the Israeli intelligence in, in a topic which is very unusual for intelligence, and this is immigration. That's probably even more sensitive than dealing with um, Arab military capabilities. Um, since Israel perceived itself not just as a state of the Israelis and for the Israelis, but also a state for the Jews whenever, wherever they are. So the Israeli intelligence is becoming the Jewish intelligence uh, with two specific missions. One, to protect Jewish communities uh, which are in peril, mainly in Arab countries. Uh, Jewish communities that are uh, persecuted by the local authorities. And secondly, to bring those Jews from the countries that they are not allowed to immigrate, to bring them over to Israel. Um, recently, um, the Israeli intelligence was, uh, was trying and is still trying to bring over Ethiopian Jews from Ethiopia, what was known as Operation Moses. So that, I think, was even more, uh, it was tougher than um, talking, researching uh, for Mossad or for Amman. And there is a special unit dealing with Jewish immigration. Who, 
Well, first of all, how do you become a member of one of these intelligence gathering organizations and who cannot be a member? Hmm. Well, the latter question is hard to say. Uh, they ought to be open-minded, and they might be, but most of the uh, agents or operatives that they recruit are from elite combat units, people, usually men in the Israeli armed forces, who prove their, their courage and their their intelligence, their, their, their smarts in these units. Uh, occasionally, we even spotted a, a newspaper ad, which appeared to be from the intelligence community, asking for people with military experience and languages, foreign passport preferred for interesting work abroad. Now, it sounded like it was probably for the Mossad, so maybe they're having a little bit of trouble recruiting, which we indeed had heard. So, personal recommendations, oh, we could be through academic institutions. The army still is the key, which, which of course makes it hard for women, by the way, because you don't have women in combat units. You have to be Jewish. Well, no, not necessarily. actually not. Even in the Israeli army, not, not everyone is Jewish. It's difficult to be an Arab Muslim and be in the Israeli army, but they have volunteers as well. There have been Druze, certainly, you know, that minority that's in several countries of the Middle East, including Israel. Circassian Muslims, it's a particular group of Muslims, some of whom have been wonderfully patriotic to Israel. That's a matter of volunteering, as I say, and there are volunteers. During a recent uh, American involvement in Panama, I know at least in this network, uh, there were a tremendous number of calls about an Israeli Mossad agent by the name of Harari. Mike Harari. Fellow with the dark glasses. Fellow with the dark glasses right here. This is Mr. Noriega. Whatever happened to Mike Harari, and how did he get to be this man's intelligence assistant? Mike Harari uh, was uh, an intelligence officer for many, many years. He worked for the Shin Bet, for the domestic security service in the early 50s. Later on, he joined Mossad, the foreign arm of the Israeli intelligence. Uh, he became an operational officer for the Mossad. In 1972, he was selected by the head of the Mossad at that time, General Tzvi Zamir, to lead the hit team, which was after Palestinian terrorists involved in the, uh, in the Minnick massacre of, uh, of the Olympics. After the failure of 1973 in Norway, uh, Mike Harari was not uh, was not was not asked any questions. Uh, the failure was swept under the carpet, and uh, the intelligence community tried to avoid the embarrassment by by ignoring uh, uh, what happened without establishing inquire inquiry committees to investigate what really happened, what went wrong, and even maybe as a, as a as a prize as an award he was given. Uh, a station uh, assignment to to be station chief in Central America in Mexico and uh, for six or five years he worked for Mossad for the Israeli intelligence in Mexico City in charge of Israeli activities Mossad intelligence activities in Central America that's how he befriended Colonel Noriega now in 1980 he retired, he left the service, he left the Mossad, started, uh, started working as an independent, legitimate businessman, as an insurance broker in Israel. He wasn't so successful, and he realized that actually what he knows is the, his old craft, the intelligence craft. And he went abroad um, and uh, started working for Colonel Noriega and became his right-hand man. On the day of the American invasion, he got out somehow. Oh, that's a very interesting and good question, yeah. yeah. How? Like we think the Americans could have caught him if they'd really wanted to. Perhaps you'll recall there were rumors on the very day and the next day that they had caught the Israeli former Mossad man who had been Orega's right-hand man. But they didn't seem to have caught him because he turned up in Israel and gave a TV interview, the first in his life, in which he said, why is everyone picking on me? I was doing work in Central America. I'm a nice fellow. I've got my own company here. Leave me alone. If you keep saying these things about me, you're putting my life in danger. Very first interview in his life. Uh, at the beginning of this year, January of this year. Um, anyway, in Panama, I can't say that we yet have the full explanation, but uh, I, we've concluded that it's more likely that Harari, like many Israeli intelligence operatives, and in this case a former one, knew who's the winning side. 
He could see Noriega was on his way down, the Americans soon to come in. Uh, he probably more or less jumped sides, probably gave the Americans some information, probably was allowed to slip out just beautifully, easily, got back to Israel. Are there others who used to be Mossad, Shimbet, Amman, who are now mercenaries around the world? Well, th this is one of the major concerns of, of this book. We have a special uh, chapter called Business at All Cost, uh, a chapter which is dealing with the phenomena that many Israeli veterans of the intelligence community of the armed forces are uh, looking for uh, new jobs as consultants, as uh, trainers, and some of them are landing up with the most brutal regimes in the world, training drug dealers in Colombia, assisting uh, dictators in uh, Africa, working with uh, brutal regimes in Central America. Mm. And we believe that the Israeli government must tighten its control over its citizens. Most of them are not anymore in service. They don't work for the government. They don't represent the agencies. They are privateers. We call them formers, former intelligence officers, former military officers. They believe they, that they uh, served Israeli interests. We think that they give Israel a bad name. Israelis have to learn how to cut them off and or employ them or make it clear who they are and who they aren't. And it's, it has just ruined Israel's name in many places. Is it hard to stay objective? You've been on this story, what, 10 years? 12 years 12 in my years. case, yeah. I got to Tel Aviv in 78. I, mean, do you, do I, I consider myself a professional fence-sitter, and uh, I don't find it terribly hard. First, in Israeli politics, between the Labor Party and the right-wing Likud, I listen to both. There's a lot of sense in what they both say and a lot of problems in what they both say. And then you get the Arab-Israeli dispute. So no, I think I'm a fence-sitter and that especially for this project it was important not to bring a political bias to it because so many people have great stories to tell and if you just fit them together carefully, almost, if I dare say it, like an intelligence operative would do, it's boring work usually, lots of little scraps of information. We felt like we were pasting them together and making sense out of it. And then when we could, run it by someone bring it and say, is this the way it happened? And if it made sense, great. It wasn't a matter of politics. We, we try to avoid uh, political judgment. We are professional journalists, and this book is not about politics. It's about the Israeli intelligence, and we have been trying to be fair and to judge its, each incident on the merits of it without any political bias. Well, let me deal with something that uh, we get from our audience all the time. You're an Israeli citizen. Yes. And people that live in Israel become very much involved in the fight to survive. How do you then, as a journalist, an Israeli citizen, do, you know, separate yourself from the need to survive? I, I don't see any contradiction between me as an Israeli patriot, and I'm not ashamed to declare here that I am an Israeli patriot. I do believe that Israel has the right to exist and that there, is a pla there must be a place for the Jews, and yet I can be... Uh, an, an objective journalist and that's what I have been doing uh, since I, uh, I, I left my military service. I served three years in the Israeli army like any other Israeli, went to university and since then for 14 years I've been working as a journalist, establishing myself as a, as a professional, professional journalist and there is no contradiction as I don't see any contradiction between a fight for survival uh, and democracy. Israel is doing both, is fighting for its survival, sometimes rightly, sometimes uh, with wrong policies, but yet trying to maintain democratic values. And maybe it's a unique case in, in the modern world. Intelligence service in Israel, you write about uh, the last several years, has the morale gone down and has the capability gone down? Well, any intelligence uh fraternity is a reflection of its society, and Israel has had its problems. Some, some might call it the problems of middle age, but uh, when I've said that before, I've been criticized by saying middle age. I mean, it's going to die in 30 years? I don't really mean that, but as the country became about 40 years old, it faced a new set of challenges, a brain drain, 
this affects the intelligence community. Uh, some of the best and brightest people leaving the country. Oh, questions about the values of society. Once a charming, small, socialist country that you felt sorry for, surrounded by a sea of Arabs, and now the world doesn't feel sorry for you, and all Israelis have to contend with that, including Israel spies. They don't have the natural sympathy they had before in various countries where they wanted to operate in the past in Scandinavia. Uh, the case earlier that we said the hit team that got arrested, the Norwegians did catch some, but went easy on them, let them go. I'm not sure they'd go so easy on Israelis these days. So there's that problem. Uh, recruiting, uh, not so much sympathy in the world, not quite as much sympathy at home either because of the string of uh, failures in the 80s. Not all Israelis feel that comfortable with their secret defenders anymore. So they've got a lot of challenges. Now, some hopes. Uh, in the last two years, Israel has launched two satellites, experimental satellites. Both of them come in, come, come in since burned up in the atmosphere. There will be more. And the satellites in the future will no doubt be spy-in-the-sky kind of satellites. That will be a great boost, especially to military intelligence. They will feel they can now see the enemy without relying on the U.S. for satellite photos. That, that's an example, really, of the technological edge the Israelis would like to emphasize. And there are some other examples of Israeli society and its intelligence as reflecting the spirit of the society is trying to reform itself. Um, the Israelis were surprised 30, 30 months ago by the Palestinian uprising. That the Palestinian people suddenly after 20 years of Israeli occupation said enough is enough and are still involved in, in, in a struggle, in a civilian disobedience sometimes getting sore and very violent and the intelligence was the intelligence community was surprised like the rest of the society and the israeli government they didn't believe that the palestinians they would would be able to do it they didn't see the palestinians as a as a political entity as as people with uh, national aspirations and yet a year later a year and a half ago it was the Israeli military intelligence in charge of providing the government with the national, the annual national intelligence estimate, which acknowledged that the Palestinian people are led by the PLO. Whether Israel like it or not, it's a fact of life. And Israel has to accommodate itself with that political factor. Now, that was the military intelligence. The Prime Minister, Mr. Shamir, didn't like the idea, and he still doesn't like it. But the intelligence had enough, had enough courage to tell the government, this is a fact of life. You might like it, you might not like it, but our job, our duty is to tell you the truth. That might be an encouraging sign, because in the past, uh, you know, with the prevailing spirit of Israeli politics, intelligence agencies were just going along going along with the old concept, for instance, therefore not seeing the 1973 war coming, not seeing the Palestinian uprising coming. Maybe they're getting a, a little more courage back now. You're right that they uh, got caught in 73 because they got cocky after 67. Uh, where do you see it today? Can they, can the 73 happen again in 1990? Not really. I don't think they have a concept that the Arabs would never attack. Yeah, uh, the Israelis are far more cautious now. I don't think they're cocky. In fact, uh, what you see this year are exercises by senior Israeli military officers, including the head of military intelligence, who does talk to the press. The other agency chiefs are secretive, but military intelligence does. I think he's trying to cheer up the people. There have been a series of press conferences in Israel in which they explain, though not with full details, that Israel can defend itself against chemical attack or warheads that might be launched from Syria or especially Iraq. They don't give the full information, but it's almost to, you know, keep the people's spirit up. Is there a nuclear capability in Israel? Uh, the official policy of Israel is that um, they never, the government ne has never admitted that Israel has nuclear capabilities, nuclear weapons. The official line is, the government line is, Israel will not be the first country in the Middle East to introduce nuclear weapons. Yet, it is worldwide assumed that Israel does have nuclear capabilities. And uh, well, I think... it's my chapter, maybe. <laughs> no, it, it, I, I, the, I think the Arabs know it. I mean, they, especially after Mordecai Vanunu who worked at the, at the nuclear installations in Dimona, 
uh, went abroad and told this story, sold this story for a British newspaper. Mm. By the way, where is Dimona located? In the, in the south of Israel, in the Negev Desert. And, and the question you saw me express a moment ago was just basically that it is a taboo topic in Israel. It's generally not for Israelis to discuss. It's foreign analysts, it's the CIA, for instance, who have a, a keen interest in Israel's nuclear program, who've been able to establish what they could, and uh, much of the data that uh, I was able to obtain on that subject came from foreigners, because the signs are there, shipments of uh, certain technology, certain developments that are occurring. And uh, I don't think the Israelis really want you to think they don't have the nuclear bomb. In other words, they want you to think they do, because that has a deterrence effect. Uh, the Iraqis are much less likely to start a war if they think that they'd immediately be, de be destroyed by a nuclear bomb. And the deterrence, well, it actually seems to work. You write uh, about Saddam Hussein. And before I ask you the question about him, uh, when did you, when was this book, when did you, when did you put it to bed? What, what was the date? The end of January this year. And you indicate in here that Saddam Hussein of Iraq is trying to build up the largest force in that part of the world and become the leader militarily, and we've just experienced an example of it. Uh, did that surprise you at all, what he did uh, with Kuwait and the oil? No, no, I'm not surprised. And he might have a few, few more surprises in his uh, pocket. Um, Can the Israelis handle a million people under arms in Iraq? Well, it's, it's a tough question. And the Israeli intelligence, the Israeli armed forces are very much concerned about uh, the size of the Iraqi uh, army and even more than that, about its uh, quality. Uh, Iraq was involved in the last decade in a bloody war with Iran for 10 years. And Iraqi soldiers, Iraqi tank commanders, Iraqi pilots acquired a lot of experience. Plus, that Iraq has now very sophisticated delivery capabilities, missiles, missiles which can eat Tel Aviv. And Israel is very much concerned about it. Just recently, the Director General, number two in the Israeli Defense Ministry, General Ivry, a former uh, commander of the Israeli Air Force, said that he believes that Israel is not prepared psychologically and otherwise for the possibility that for the first time, the next war in the Middle East, if there is a war, and hopefully, I, I, I hope that the war will not occur, uh, Israeli towns um, would be, might be exposed uh, for the first time in the history of Israel uh, for Arab attacks, Missile, missiles, bombs, maybe um, air raids. Uh, all previous wars were fought on Arab lands, in the, in the front, and Israeli citizens, civilians, were not harmed. Yeah, ask you about money. Um, again, if you were seated, seated right at this desk and we were taking telephone calls, by now the calls would come in saying the United States gives an extraordinary amount of money every year to Israel, and you'd hear figures all the way from 3.2 billion up to 10 billion, depending on how you, mm, how you calculate it. I want to ask Dan Raviv, how much money every year does the U.S. taxpayer give to Israel? I think basically it's the published uh, grant and loans, and I know most of the loans end up being excused, of $3.8 billion is where it stands. That's what the Israelis are working on to keep it at the very least at 3.8. They no longer expect uh, increases. Is that including the, the housing money for the uh, immigrants? Mm, probably not, but uh, those are supposed to be loan guarantees, aren't they? And uh, it's not going to... Uh, exceed that by much, even if it touches four billion because of some special allocations, because of special needs. There's not but, a lot of hidden money there somewhere coming in with, in, in various ways? No, I really don't think that there is. You can talk about the expense, but I don't think it would be right to, of the uh, sixth fleet, the U.S. fleet in the Mediterranean visiting Haifa Harbor. But that's very much in the U.S. interest. They really do want to visit the harbor there. They really do want to preposition weapons, medical supplies in Israel, rather secretive. Don't know the full details of that, but that's not really for the sake of Israel. That's the U.S. that wants a little prepositioning in Israel. I guess what I'm trying to say is, and I hear it all the time when I go to Israel, they don't want to tell me everything, but they're always trying to assure an American visitor such as myself that it's worth it. The U.S., you guys are getting the value. You are. Did anybody come to you, Yossi, uh, either one of you, as a matter of fact, and say, don't write this book? 
No. No? Did no. anybody come to you and say, um, we understand you're writing this book and we'd appreciate you not writing about, say, the nuclear uh, bomb situation? Well, as Dan mentioned earlier, being an Israeli, working in Israel, I know uh, how the Israeli censorship and how the defense uh, establishment is working. So there, there were certain elements which I believed that would endanger life, so I decided I wouldn't write about them, like naming uh, Mossad agents working in Arab countries. I wouldn't do it. It's really endangering their life, and it's, it's not necessarily to do it. Do you know that for a fact? Do you know who they, they are? They, I, there were some, well, I, I, I'm, I, I don't know all of them, and, and that's the way it should be, but at least I can think of one case when I self-censored myself when it, when it comes to, the, to that kind of information. Are there any Arab intelligence agents that have ever been caught inside Israel? Oh, yes, but uh, most of the attempts compared with the sophisticated Israeli efforts to set up elaborate cover stories and plant people in, in Syria, as we discussed, and also in Egypt, the Arab efforts are kind of elementary. On the other hand, of course, those that are truly successful you never hear about, but the people who were caught, not too impressive, not that many. I think we only have about five cases or so. Someone who came from Egypt, took another identity, moved there as a, uh, you know, as a, as a Jew who was moving there. Uh, the concern by the Israelis is really much more, it has been with Soviet bloc penetration. Well, now there's not a Soviet bloc, but has been with, uh, with that concern. They've been on the lookout for communist country penetration, always in the belief, and it was a valid one, that the Soviet Union would pass along almost everything it learned to Syria, or at sometimes to Egypt, in other words, to Israel's enemies. So they're on the lookout for Soviet agents, and they still are. We have 10,000 and more Soviet Jews moving to Israel every month now that Gorbachev has opened the gates. It's a certain thing that there are spies, KGB spies among them. Plant. What's the closest that uh, any uh, Israeli intelligence agent, I assume a Mossad agent, has gotten to Yasser Arafat? Well, is, uh, Yas Yasser Arafat um, was, uh, for several years at least, uh, in the early 60s and uh, maybe even early 70s, top on the Israeli agenda. He, the Israeli intelligence wanted to get him. Assassinate him. Assassinate him. And I think even, uh, we, we, we talk about it in our book, even in during the war in Lebanon, car... Uh, Car bombs exploded near his headquarters. Aerial bombing seemed to take place only for the reason that he was reported to be in that apartment. And building. they missed him. And uh, he's, a, he's a great survivor. And he survived endless attempts on his, on his life, not just by Israeli agents. Also, he has a lot of Arab enemies, Palestinian extremists such as Abu Nidal, uh, Syrian agents. On the other hand, there is a question, maybe it's a, a more of philosophical nature, which has been discussed by the Israeli intelligence. What good would it do if we kill the head of a, a terrorist organization? Sometimes maybe it's, it's better to, to let him live since we can deal with the devil we know rather than with the uncertainties of a replacement. And I think that uh, the approach that is used by the Israeli intelligence is that when you are dealing with small, tiny terrorist organizations, organizations which are dependent heavily on the leader, it's like small gangs, then maybe if you kill the leader, you destroy the organization. But when it comes to larger groups like the one that is led by Yasser Arafat, it won't do any good by killing the leader. Dan Raviv, what's this picture? Uh, it's the other hand. There always is another hand in this business. It's a picture of a villa in Tunisia, near the capital, Tunis, where a Mossad team with uh, special Israeli commandos landed from the sea just over two years ago and killed Abu Jihad, the number two man in the PLO. You see, that's the on the other hand. It wouldn't do any good to kill Yasser Arafat, so the thinking goes. But to remind the PLO of who's really in charge of the long reach of the Mossad, in April 88, one of the men who was organizing the Palestinian uprising was killed at his home in that villa in Tunisia. 
Dal Camoni, we've heard this name recently. Uh, there's been another book out on Pan Am 103. Here's a picture. It's a strange looking picture though. Yossi, explain why it doesn't look normal. Because this picture was taken by a hidden camera. Um, photographed of Dal Camoni. Which one by, is he? Uh, Far right. Yes, this one. This is Dal Camoni, the notorious Dal Camoni. It was taken by um, West German agents, trailed, shadowing him when he was in Germany, uh, planning his uh, attack on Pan Am. Now, it belongs in this book because the Germans were on to the so-called Dalkamoni cell, part of the PFLP General Command, a Palestinian terrorist group based in Syria. They were on to him thanks to Israeli tips. The Israelis were also watching the cell, wondering what they were up to. The conclusion reached, they wanted to blow up an aircraft, but they thought another aircraft, a flight from Spain to Israel, was the target. So they felt very pleased when the terror cell, or most of the members, were arrested in October of 88, and that flight was safe. But two months later, the Germans had allowed most of the uh, alleged terrorists out, and two months later, Pan Am 103 blew up. General question, we have about out of time. Um, what have we not covered in here? that you think the audience that will read this book will find fascinating? What, what elements of the book? I was surprised to find out uh, what I would call the humanitarian side of the Israeli intelligence. And that's what maybe makes the Israeli intelligence so unique and so special. There is a special unit in Israel in charge of emigration. Try to imagine the CIA or British MI6 are involved in that kind of, of, um, of work. Since Israel is the state of the Jewish people, so is the Israeli intelligence, the Jewish intelligence, and he is trying to bring over Jews from countries like Iran, from some Arab countries, which don't allow them to immigrate. And this is a fascinating story. It's a very heroic story. Israeli agents are ready to go to the most obscure places and danger places in the world to bring over their Jewish brethren. And what about the history? A lot of the history of the Mossad and the Amman and all that stuff, what, what did you find in the history of the organizations that uh, you found particularly interesting? Lessons that were learned and should have been learned in the early years. We start in 1948 with the birth of the state. We haven't discussed the title, Every Spy a Prince, the, the notion that God told Moses to choose the first spies uh, 32 centuries ago to go into the land of Israel, choose them from every tribe, every one of them a prince. They were supposed to be the elite. And the idea of the history, right in the upper left, Reuven Shiloach, the first prince of intelligence. What a dedicated man. Mr. Intelligence, the founder of the Mossad, Reuven Shiloach, almost unknown. And there uh, in the upper right, if it's in the picture as well, is Isser Harel. Now, he is known because he's written books on the subject. He was the head of Israeli intelligence for 10 years. He was the emperor, years. emperor of the Israeli agree, intelligence. An emperor, and indeed, he made it into an empire. And there in the lower Shola left, Shola Vigor one of the founders of Israeli intelligence, interested in what Yossi just mentioned. He, he was in charge of that unit called, revealed for the first time in our book, Liaison Bureau, in charge of bringing over Jews from the Soviet Union and Eastern Bloc countries. In all the, the, the book, maybe this isn't a fair question, who's your favorite intelligence operative over the years that you uh, wrote about? How fascinating. It's hard I, to say. Yeah, I know. I guess as a professional fence-sitter, I, I don't have a biting affection necessarily. You, you admire Ellie Cohen for his ability to penetrate Syria, but then he went too far, kept transmitting on the Morse code key, got caught, got hanged, and you think, that was dumb. You admire Wolfgang Lotz for doing it in Egypt, and maybe admire him more because he got away with it. The champagne spy? That's yeah. what he called himself. They Why? remember him, well, they remember him at Mossad headquarters especially because of his expense accounts. Lots of champagne, but lots of Egyptian officials loved him. Who do you remember? Uh, I think that Ruven Shiloach was a very interesting person. He tried to um, maybe imitate, to build the Israeli intelligence from scratches. F uh, build it, to model it on the British example. To bring British uh, spy, espionage craft into the Israeli uh, society. And uh, he, wa he was laying down all the fundamental details which later on became, became so uh, obvious, so identified with the Israeli intelligence. He had the imagination to even know that 
Israel shall negotiate with Arabs. Last question. We are out of time. This book is dedicated to Dory, Jonathan, and Emma. Who are they? My wife, my two kids. And to Billy and Yotam? My wife and my kid. The name of the book is Every Spy a Prince, The Complete History of Israel's Intelligence Community. Our two guests have been Dan Raviv and Yossi Melman. Thank you, gentlemen, both for joining us. And to our audience, have a Thank good evening. You.